Hello and welcome to the third concert in the Grant Park Music Festival's 2021 season. I'm Seth Bosted, and I'm really excited to be the lecturer for this summer's series of concerts. How exciting it is to get back to making music for live audiences as well. This concert will happen on July 9th and 10th, and it's kind of a heavy hitter of a program in many respects, uh, lining up a lot of audience favorites in one place. The concert opens up with Vivaldi's Great Gloria, uh, and that features the Grant Park Music Festival Chorus, as well as the orchestra. And then we'll go to the Barber Adagio for Strings, music that is always played, oh, for solemn occasions, state funerals, any time that music of great gravity and beauty is required, uh, the Barber Adagio for Strings is played. And then Brahms' Third Symphony, a piece that shows one of the great classical composers at the height of his creative powers. As I said, the program opens up with Vivaldi's Gloria, featuring the Grant Park Chorus. And I spoke with Christopher Bell, the Grant Park Chorus Music Director, about this wonderful work. So Vivaldi Gloria, what a wonderful opening to the choral program for the Grant Park Music Festival 2021. Um, Vivaldi Gloria, very popular piece. Um, actually, if you're a kind of a choral music geek, you could look up and discover that there are two Vivaldi Glorias. He wrote a second one. The second one hardly ever performed, or the other one rather, hardly ever performed. But uh, the one you're going to hear um, at the beginning of 2021 with the Grand Park Chorus is a perennial favorite. Um, what is it about it? It's uh, beautifully melodic, uh, very catchy, um, uh, very appealing, very straightforward, very direct. Um, it's not, if I say it doesn't over challenge, it's just a wonderful piece to be listening to, uh, to have happening around you. Singers, um, I'd be interested to know how many times recently uh, our professional singers have done Vivaldi Gloria, because it is usually, certainly in the UK, um, it is the staple of um, amateur choruses. Um, doesn't usually get done by professionals. So I will be, one of the first questions I'll be asking the chorus when I meet them in a couple of days time is, how many times have you performed this? Maybe they've done it many, many times, but actually I think the chances are not very often. Grand Park Festival 2021 is giving our Grand Park Chorus Choristers an unparalleled opportunity to step to the front of the stage. When we started planning this festival many, many months ago, restrictions were in a very, very different place. Um, and who was to know whether we could fly singers across the country, whether we could bring them in even from Canada. And we certainly couldn't even consider trying to get the various different permissions to bring people from the UK. So that's the point at which we turned to the talent that lives within our chorus. Now, I'm thrilled to say that virtually all of the soloists this summer are come, come from the Grant Park Chorus roster. And so it's given me great pleasure to be able to go through the roster and uh, match the solos to the various different voices that I know. I think you're in for an enormous treat. That's Christopher Bell, the director of the Grant Park Music Festival Chorus, talking about this wonderful piece, the Vivaldi Gloria. As he says, uh, this is one of two Gloria settings that Vivaldi did, but by far, this is the one that is the most performed. And I think that's because in this piece, we really see Vivaldi combining successfully his gift for dramatic opera, he does include arias, for example, in the 12 movements of the Gloria, with his sincere religious feeling. He was, after all, an ordained priest. And for a big part of his career, he worked for the Ospedale della Pietà in Venice, which was one of four orphanages in the city that provided musical training for the girls that were in the orphanage. Uh, boys were expected to leave. <laughs> they were given technical training and then hopefully out the door uh, by 16, but by about the time they start causing trouble. Uh, girls, on the other hand, could stay at the orphanage their whole lives if they wanted to. If they didn't get married or become a nun, um, they could remain at the orphanage. But what was fascinating about these four orphanages, and especially because of Vivaldi, the Pietà, was that they gave musical training to the girls who had talent. Uh, so it's a fascinating thing to think about that a lot of Vivaldi's music was written to be performed by women, uh, whether that was instrumentally or in this case vocally. Today the Gloria is sung by male and female singers, but in Vivaldi's time all of the parts, including the tenor and bass parts, were sung by women. Let's hear a little bit of the first two movements. We'll start with Gloria, the first movement, and then go to Et in Terra Pax, the second movement, and on Earth, Peace. Music of Vivaldi from the Gloria. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's talk about the Barber Adagio for strings. Uh, it is, uh, as I said before, this uh, kind of uh, grandiloquent piece, this huge statement for a string orchestra that stirs up the most profound feelings in anyone who listens to it. It's performed at the most uh, gravitous, is that a word? It's performed at the most solemn occasions, occasions with great gravity, and uh, will always be, I think. It just has that kind of resonant quality with uh, listeners. It is a relatively simple piece, though, musically, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it was originally a string quartet. It was the third movement of a string quartet that Barber wrote. And uh, the conductor, Arturo Toscanini, I guess, sensed its promise, its dramatic potential, and asked Barber to arrange it for string orchestra. And uh, from the second it was performed, it has become a classic of the repertory. It is a, a fairly simple piece, as I say. The, the chord progression remains more or less static throughout the piece. Uh, it has only one real melody that repeats throughout the piece, although Barber is quite canny about moving it around the various and sundry string choirs. Uh, and same thing with the harmonies. Uh, it's mostly a tonal piece, but Barber introduces a counter melody that causes some very interesting uh, suspensions, which, which create some momentary dissonances that are resolved. And of course, uh, dramatically speaking, the piece builds to this gigantic apotheosis, this incredible emotional outpouring. Uh, and then there's silence. And then it starts up again, almost as if that hadn't happened. And then it ends on the V chord, which is an unresolved chord. I'll talk about that a little bit more. The piece is very slow, and it, it moves very slowly. It's almost impossible to drop the needle on the barber piece in any kind of meaningful way. So what I decided to do instead was to follow the theme around. Um, so we're going to listen to a little bit of the very opening, where we hear the theme in the violins. I'm going to fade that down. We'll move up a little bit uh, to about a minute and a half into the piece where it comes into the violas. We'll hear it back in the violins again into the violas. I'll fade down and then it makes its way down into the cellos. And you'll already hear it starting to build towards that apotheosis I was talking about. So let's hear this, the, the, the main theme in Barber's Adagio for Strings. That's the main theme of Barber's Adagio for Strings, pretty much the only theme in the whole piece. Again, musically, this is a very simple piece, and yet it's often the most simple music that is the most effective, certainly the case here with uh, what, what Barber has done with the Adagio. Uh, I want to talk about it a little bit harmonically. I'm going to jump up to the end and play a couple of minutes before the end, uh, where we will hear the melody again, and then we hear an F chord, which is the V chord, and we hear the B flat minor chord alternating. So generally speaking in music, uh, diatonic harmony, uh, harmony that is tonal, we think about the one chord as being home. This is where the music often starts. This is where the music wants to come to rest. And then the five chord, well, we used to call it work. <laughs> we used to say that's work because it's the place you spend most of your time outside of the home. But coming out of COVID, I have no idea where people spend their time anymore. So the five chord is away from home. Let's just call it that. <laughs> it's away from home. And it goes back home 98% of the time in classical music. It does not in the barber. He does something very fascinating at the end of the work. Uh, he plays with the A, which is the third of the chord. Very beautiful tone. Wants to resolve up to that B flat. Really wants to resolve up to that B flat. But Barber knows something about our psychology, which is that if you continue to emphasize any given chord long enough, we start to think maybe that's the tonic. And so we have this unresolved 
chord that at first you're like, oh, is he going to leave us hanging? He's going to leave us hanging. <laughs> and it feels there's a little bit of anxiety, but then he stays on that F chord so long that it actually becomes the new tonic and becomes a source of comfort in itself. It's a fantastic moment where an unresolved chord almost becomes the new tonic in a way. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, it's the end of the Adagio for Strings by Samuel Barber. And uh, to me, it's just this fascinating. It's almost like uh, magic in a way. This is what a composer can do with one chord. <laughs> uh, at the very beginning of the ending, he hints at the melody again. Now, even slower than it was before. Much, much slower. Uh, that A up to the B flat, up to the C. But then he goes back to the A, and then he just lingers on that F chord. And we have one chord for a minute or more, and it's absolutely magical. The program concludes with the Brahms Third Symphony, which is not only a fascinating symphony, but it is a fascinating part of the development of a very interesting composer, Brahms himself. When Brahms was a young man, he went to see Robert Schumann, who was not only the most famous composer at that time, but also the most famous writer about music. And Brahms showed Schumann some of his piano works, and Schumann was duly impressed. And uh, so, unbeknownst to Brahms, he wrote in his journal, which was read by most musicians throughout Europe, that Brahms was uh, the, the natural inheritor to Beethoven. Of course, this had, had a two-pronged effect on uh, poor Brahms. On the one hand, he was quite flattered. Oh, it's me. That's great. How, how cool. Uh, but on the other hand, he was really nervous, like, oh my gosh, I now have to live up to Beethoven. And as a result, it took him nearly 20 years to write his first symphony. Uh, Brahms was a very careful person. He, uh, it's interesting because he did live up. It, it, everyone you know, thinks that he lived up to Beethoven or the expectations that he was the next Beethoven in many respects. And he did that through a combination of kind of hubris, knowing that he had the talent, knowing that he had the skill, but also carefulness, thinking about it, really, really planning and thinking. And we see him just get gradually more and more comfortable over the course of his career. So the first symphony takes almost 20 years with Brahms revising and revising and revising. And then the second symphony is written within a year. The third symphony, which we'll hear on this program, was written in four months. But the third symphony was finished in 1883. And so it's pretty fascinating because by that time, well, Wagner was already dead. Uh, Berlioz was dead. These were guys who were thinking that Beethoven is, is wonderful. Nobody didn't like Beethoven, but we need to move on. We need to go a different direction. We're going to push ahead into the Romantic era, what we would maybe call the German Romantic era. We're going to write operas. We're going to write tone poems. Uh, we're going to do all of these things. And Brahms and uh, Clara Schumann and Mendelssohn, they were saying no. There's still a lot more to say in the old forms. So by the time Brahms finishes the Third Symphony in 1883, to a certain extent, a huge part of Europe had already moved on from the classical tradition, and nobody really quite knew what to make of the symphony. But of course, today we're really happy that Brahms continued in the classical vein because those old fights don't really matter. From our perspective, we can appreciate Wagner and Brahms equally. And the Third Symphony is a great grand statement by a composer at the height of his powers. Uh, so, you know, it's a huge symphony, so I'm just going to share a couple of my own favorite moments with you. In some respects, the third movement is similar to what you expect from a classical symphony. Uh, it is in 3-4, four, for example, but it's not a minuet and trio. It's not really a dance movement, uh, but it's one of my favorite movements. The, I love the theme, so I'm going to start at the very beginning where the theme is stated in the cellos, and then I'm going to jump up to this great moment where uh, the French horn takes up the theme and then the oboes. This is the one.
That's a little bit of the third movement of Brahms' third symphony. Just uh, my own personal favorite. You know, if a symphony like this, it's so large in many respects. Uh, I think it's nice. I, I can just zone in on some of my own personal favorite moments. And that melody to me is just such a wonderful melody. This is classical music at its at its best. And I mean classical music from the classical era, even though it was written well into the Romantic era and we're moving almost now into Bruckner and Mahler. And yet here's Brahms still embracing these old structures and still doing marvelously with them. Let's move on now to the fourth movement, the final movement of the Brahms Third Symphony. This is generally a big statement in any classical music symphony. Uh, it's oftentimes a theme in variations, a rondo. Uh, here is another sonata allegra form. So again, uh, some kind of melody, some kind of statement, and then a development section and a recapitulation. In the recapitulation, though, Brahms does something very interesting. He brings back that F A flat F melody, the happy but free from the very first movement, but here transformed in a fascinating way. But let's start with the opening, because this is almost a creepy theme by classical music standards. And then there's a secondary theme that I, I think is quite nice. And then I want to move ahead a little bit in the symphony where um, we're coming out of the development section into that secondary theme and then moving into a dramatic section right before the recapitulation. Music from the fourth movement of Brahms' Third Symphony, and unfortunately it's all the time that I have to walk you through the Brahms' Third Symphony, but you don't need a roadmap for this piece. It's phenomenal music by any standards. Uh, again, a bit of a duck out of water in its own time, but today considered a classic for obvious reasons. That's my talk. Uh, thanks so much for listening. I'm Seth Bosted. Hope to see you at a future lecture.